Well, welcome back, everyone. As we enter into this third section of this, this Building on Solid Rock retreat, where we are indeed hoping that we, with all of you, with all of us, for all of us around the world who wish to spread the flame of love, have it placed in context, to have it placed on the foundation on which it belongs, Jesus Christ himself and the gospel that he brings, the will of the Father and the life of the Holy Spirit within us. We have a huge amount to cover today. This is perhaps, as I say, the most important of the retreats, something that strikes at the very heart of why we were made, our relationship with God, as it is transformed by the effect of grace. So let's launch right into things. This will, this will run a long one, as I advertise as a two and a half hour one, and we'll probably take every minute of it. So let's go ahead and begin with prayer, as we always do. And as I always mention as well, not me praying, but let us all pause a moment in silence and ask for our Lord's will to take place here, for the Spirit to inspire every heart, no matter what is said. Our Lord can do wonders and what we take into our own souls and to our own hearts and our own minds. So let us pray. So please, O oh Lord, you know our hearts as imperfect as they are, they wish to serve you. They wish to spread the flame of love of the Immaculate Heart of Mary everywhere, that the whole world is deeply in love with you and transformed by the effect of grace. So please inspire all that happens here, so that we may do exactly that, be instruments in your hands, directed by our Blessed Mother, consecrated to her, and doing her work in the world to bring the world to you, Jesus. In your holy name we pray, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So as we mentioned, the flame of love brings us always back to Jesus. It's the flame of love himself, of course. It always brings us back to the heart of the gospel. It's not some new prayer devotion. It is so much bigger and so much simpler. It is, Jesus and I were conversing recently about how easy it is to both underestimate and overcomplicate the flame of love. And you'll be hearing more and more about that as, as we continue to provide formation for our, our leaders to make sure that we do look at the flame of love as truly the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. It is nothing less. And of course, it'll happen by grace. It is that powerful, but it is also is very simple. It's a, this wind blowing through the church to renew it to the world, to bring it in through alive through the effect of grace. And so as we mentioned, even in the simple devotional elements that we have, our Blessed Mother is bringing us to focus on the gospel that we, we are introduced to the meditation of the five wounds, offering ourselves to the Heavenly Father through this love that we see demonstrated on the cross to make it very clear what the love of God is, as the first epistle of St. John tells us, as opposed to our human love, those loves that Jesus contrasted in the, in the Sermon on the Mount. You know, the love of the Father who makes his reign to fall on the just and the unjust, as opposed to those who love those who love them. And then we went to the flame of love, Hail Mary, how that kind of love is not possible for us to sustain for all eternity as God does, except by the miracle of grace, which is why at this time when the world needs grace, most of all, our Blessed Mother gave us the flame of love, Hail Mary, with its emphasis on grace, to spread the effect of grace, making us holy throughout all humanity. And then today's topic, how that effect of grace completely transforms our relationship with God so that its ultimate effect is that we are in complete union with Jesus, the unity prayer. And as that happens, Satan is blinded. There's no room left for him. And souls are saved. It's the gospel. <clears throat> I want to return just very, very briefly to last month's presentation on the flame of love, Hail Mary. And you recall we mentioned how, how grace works, how it the Holy Spirit comes into our lives. And we have these two voices, right? The voice of the human spirit that tends to lead us towards ourself, whether it's in good, or whether it's in love, or whether it's an overt evil. And we have the voice of the Holy Spirit that always leads us to the sacrificial, selfless love shown to us on the cross. <clears throat> and I wanted to point out as, as a reminder that this is not an occasional thing. It's not like most of the time we walk through our lives and every once in a while the Holy Spirit taps us on the shoulder and says, do that, John. No, this is an all the time thing. We are always, always listening for the movement of grace. And in fact, when we ignore that, we, we, are, we are sinning. 
we are frustrating the work of the Lord. So I want to bring out two very interesting quotes of the diary to emphasize this point that this life of grace is an all the time thing. Let me share my desktop and look at this. So the need to respond immediately to the voice of the Holy Spirit, immediately to grace is critical. When we speak of the capital sins, we speak of sloth. And we usually think of that as uh, manana, you know, that procrastination, that not doing the things that we, we should be doing, not working hard. But far more dangerous is spiritual sloth. When the Holy Spirit inspires us to do something, we say, oh, later, God, I'll get to that later. How important it is for us to respond immediately. Here on the first Sunday of January, 1964, Elizabeth writes, during the adoration of the Blessed Sacrament, he, Jesus, asked me to offer him reparation for the offenses committed by so many people paying very little attention to his inspirations. Jesus said, you know the great sin of the world. Now that should wake us up right there, right? That should wake us up right there. The great sin of the world, this is important. You know, the great sin of the world is to ignore my inspirations. And we would stop and think about it. We'd say, oh, of course. Can you imagine what the world would be like if every moment we listen to the voice of Jesus, every moment we listen to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it would change everything. It would be heaven. You know, the great sin of the world is to ignore my inspirations. It is because of that in lukewarm, consecrated souls that the world is walking in darkness. They could help me, but they're not even aware how dangerous their tepidity is. I beg you, communicate the desire in my heart to your spiritual father. Hopefully he and those who guide souls will follow my inspirations with greater fidelity and bring souls to understand the importance of this, because otherwise it is impossible to lead a spiritual life. Again, it sounds profound, but it's so obvious. If we're not listening to the Holy Spirit, how are we going to lead a spiritual life? Without this, because otherwise it is impossible to lead a spiritual life, regardless of how great their perseverance may be. Remember, this is communist Hungary. One of the reasons why we haven't processed very far with the cause for beatification of Elizabeth is because there are so many Hungarian martyrs lined up in front of her. There are many of these men and women suffered greatly and persevered greatly. But notice what Jesus said, regardless of how great their perseverance may be, if they set aside my holy inspirations, their souls will become corrupted, just like the ones entrusted to them. This is important. This is an all the time thing. Now, Elizabeth was not a visionary. She didn't see vision. She didn't have dreams. She heard Jesus and Mary speaking to her. But there are two dreams, she relates in the diary. And one of them is this dream where she sees the, the demons putting this very dark disc over, over Hungary. And they're laughing about how good a job they've done and how difficult it will be to remove. And a little later, Jesus begins to explain the dream. And he says, do you know the meaning of the disc's dense blackness? It represents the seven capital sins. This iron is composed of seven sheets, which seem to be a one piece, but are really separate. The top sheet is lust. It is a very thin and resistant layer. To remove it, it must be bent by much prayer and sacrifices. The second is negligence in doing good. This one cannot be bent. It is made of an unbreakable black color. Only with great effort, can small particles like little grains of dust be taken out. Do not fear. I will be with you in this great work, but be careful because the evil one is active. Only unceasing labor, that very hard disk of the spiritual sloth, can only be removed by that constant pounding and breaking off little pieces. Every time we respond to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we break off another piece. So all the time, we must be attuned to the voice of the Holy Spirit, attuned to responding to God immediately, attuned to responding to that grace that is alive in us, and bit by bit by bit, break off that hard, hard disk of spiritual sloth. So I just want to pass that along to make sure that we understood that this whole idea of following the voice of the Holy Spirit, of hearing these voices, 
uh, and it all that lead us following grace is not an occasional thing it's an all the time thing so with that now let us move to the topic for today the topic for today is the unity prayer this beautiful beautiful prayer that jesus gives us in fact so often this is a door opener for the for the flame of love you know parishes that might object to something else the flame of love hail mary but everybody loves the unity prayer catholics protestants orthodox everybody can relate to the unity prayer and it is so beautiful this is jesus's desire as elizabeth described it then the sweet redeemer asked me to pray with him the prayer that expresses his deepest desires and this will be the topic today how much he wishes this how much god desires this of us in fact let's go ahead and pray it together right now as we get it right in our minds, may our feet journey together. May our hands gather in unity. May our hearts beat in unison. May our souls be in harmony. May our thoughts be as one. May our ears listen to the silence together. May our glances profoundly penetrate each other. May our lips pray together to gain mercy from the eternal Father. You know, the importance of this prayer cannot be overstated. You know, for one, it has a specific grace of blinding Satan. May 4th, 1962, I try to remember that because that's the day the unity prayer was given. Jesus said, this prayer is an instrument in your hands. By collaborating with me, Satan will be blinded by it. And because of his blindness, souls will not be led into sin. This prayer is critical. It is the heart of the flame of love. That's why in, in the international guideline for Senecals that I gave, I placed it at the end of every single decade. And again, we don't have to do that. That's a guideline. It's for all of us to adapt. And it's important that we get away from the idea there's only one right way to have a cynical. You know, that's only a guideline. But I place it there because it is so important. It is the heart of the flame of love. And in fact, it is the heart of all Christianity. This is the beauty of the flame of love. They said it's not a prayer devotion. It is bringing us back to focus on the core of what christianity is and the heart of christianity is the unity prayer in fact christian unity prayer is christianity i can state it that strongly the unity prayer is christianity what is salvation what is salvation we spoke about this in the first retreat we speak about it here eternal life is being joined to the life of the trinity we don't have eternal life on our own. We absolutely need Jesus. We absolutely need him because he joined us to the life of the Trinity. And that is our eternal life. Only Jesus is fully God and fully man. That's not an obscure theological point. That's why we have it in the creed every time we pray the Nicene Creed. It is a fundamental point of Christianity. There is no Christianity without it. Only Jesus is truly God and truly man. So only Jesus can be the bridge between humanity and divinity. He is our only bridge into eternal life found in the Trinity. And we find this in the liturgy. For example, in the liturgy of the hours, one of the public prayers of the church, right? The public prayers of the church are mass and the lit liturgy of the hours, the divine office or the breviary. And in the liturgy of the hours in Monday, week two, in Psalm 45, it's a beautiful psalm about a wedding. It's you know, the, 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 the bride being brought to the king in Psalm 45. And the psalm prayer that the church gives us at the end of that psalm says, When you took on flesh, Lord Jesus, you made a marriage of mankind with God. That's what Jesus is. That's who Jesus is. And in fact, even in the Mass, every time we celebrate the Mass, we... we Focus on this truth. When we're preparing the gifts, when the deacon is preparing the chalice, or if there's no deacon, the celebrant, there is a very quiet prayer that's prayed. Sometimes you may hear it, but it's to be prayed quietly. And the deacon or the priest will pray as he pours the water into the wine. May the mystery of this water and wine, or by the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ who humbled himself to share in our humanity. Jesus, being both God and man, enables us to share in divinity. It is our eternal life. Let me share this quote 
from the diary from September 24th, 1963, where Jesus says, your bad temper will go on. Oh, don't, don't, don't be a hero of God. You get, you get beat up all the time. <laughs> Peter, David, you know, no, no, the sins aren't hidden. He says to Elizabeth, your bad temper will go on. But out of this evil nature, I will accomplish a masterpiece if you agree to submit to my divine hand. Simply surrender to me like the wine grapes that are pressed and transformed into wine, which will become my precious blood. You also will be intoxicated with my precious blood, but only if you are transformed and purified, just like the must. The must is, is when you first press out the grapes and it's got the skins and the stems and the, and the seeds and everything's all mixed together. It needs to be purified. So only if you are transformed and purified, just like the must or like the wheat transformed in my sacred body once it has been ground. You also will transform yourself only once you have been ground down and your miserable nature divinized. Whoever eats my body and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. He in whom God dwells will be divinized. Permeate yourself with this grace so great, my daughter. So indeed, the unity prayer of this union with Jesus is literally our salvation. It is Christianity. Again, we can go to the scriptures to see this. I probably shouldn't have unshared my desk so quickly. I want to go right back to the, the scriptures. And we'll go to John 15 and verse 4. Where Jesus says, abide in me and I in you. The unity prayer. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire and are burned. Our only hope of eternal life is to be joined to Jesus. The unity prayer, he says, it's again the great discourse on, on the body and blood of Jesus. John 6, 53. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat, and it's very graphic. So if anyone is worried about chewing on the Eucharist, the word here is actually to chew, to gnaw. Uh, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Our life is only in Jesus. Only through being with him do we have eternal life. Verse 11 of 1 John 5. And the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Without being joined to Jesus, we don't have life. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Pretty cut and dry, pretty straightforward. That again, Jesus is our salvation. The unity prayer is Christianity. That Jesus is that bridge between humanity and divinity. <laughs> Let me share again. I should just leave it on. Better looking at the screen than looking at me. But uh, here we want to see March 6, 1964, how Jesus described it when he's describing part of the unity prayer. Elizabeth writes, prostrating myself before him, my soul breathed words of profound humility that he aroused in me. Blessed be God. Blessed be his holy name. Right? The divine praises. She's in adoration. Blessed be Jesus Christ, true God and true man. He did not let me continue. Jesus said, your homage pleases me, my little one. But I will explain the words, true God and true man. If this were not true, how could you come closer to me? I let myself be known to you as true God and true man, not only you, but all those who eat my body and drink my blood. As true God, I penetrate your heart, and as true man, I speak to you, because my human heart beats at the same rhythm as my divinity. True God and true man, humanity and divinity. 
I speak to you because my human heart beats at the same rhythm as my divinity. Your heart beats to the same rhythm as my heart, right? May our hearts beat in unison. Do you know what this means? It means that you participate in my divinity. This is eternal life to be joined to the life of the Trinity. Do you know what this means? It means you participate in my divinity. All who feel with me. This is another reference to the unity prayer we'll talk about later. It's actually the, the meaning of the, of the phrase, may our souls be in harmony. It's actually talking about where we feel our deepest feelings. All who feel with me and whose thoughts are my thoughts, may our thoughts be as one, will receive this participation. Whoever lives this way can only bless because God blesses, right? This blessing increases the effect of my work of redemption. This effect makes you saints. Yes, the unity prayer is the heart of the flame of love. It's the heart of Christianity. And indeed, it is Christianity. And that's why Jesus desires this union so much. And it can only happen. It can only happen as the effect of grace. Yes, it's Jesus' deepest desires, and grace makes it possible. Why? Because with grace, something has fundamentally changed in the way we can relate with God. And that's the whole point of this retreat, is often we focus on spread the effect of grace or your flame of love over all of humanity. We're focusing on how grace changes the way we relate to others that we pour our lives out for others rather than living for ourselves, that we are loving others, we're caring for others, we're putting others first. But the most important change of the flame of love, the most important change of effect of grace in our life is that it fundamentally changes the nature of our relationship with God. Most of all, when the Holy Spirit comes, when grace comes, something fundamentally changes in our relationship with God. Let's look at Galatians 4, verses 4 through 7. Galatians 4, verses 4 through 7. A lot of scripture today. It's why one of the reasons why we'll, we'll run a little long. Where Paul tells us, when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. <clears throat> we are children now. And this adoption is much stronger than, than a human adoption. A human adoption is wonderful. There's that wonderful phrase, you're the child of my heart rather than my womb. And it's, and it's so true. But in God's adoption, it goes even beyond that, that we are literally made one with Jesus to partake in the life of God. Jesus is the only begotten son of God because he's the only one who directly proceeds from the father. He is not a created being. He proceeds from the father, consubstantial with the father. That's why he is the only begotten son. But we, as his creation, are brought into the very life of the Trinity by being placed into the body of Jesus a very, very strong sense of adoption, even stronger than our human sense. And again, we see this change in our relationship. John 15, I think it's verse 15. Let's see if I go to the right place. Yes, no longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. This is critically important. Something has changed in our relationship with God. In fact, the whole covenant is different. Let me see. I think there's another scripture I wanted here. Oh, yes. Yes, this is a critical one. John 17, 26. We'll come back to this a number of times, and it was in our first retreat. Something so important that it's literally the last thing that Jesus said before going to the Garden of Gethsemane to die for us. So if he was thinking, what's the most important thing I can leave with you before I, I leave you? It is this. And speaking to the Father, he says, I have made your name known, Father. I've made your name known to them and will make it known so that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. 
Yes, the very love with which the Father loves the Son, the love of the Trinity is in us. Grace has changed the way in which we can relate to God completely, totally, a whole different plane when we are transformed by grace. Now we can love God with the very same love with which God has loved within himself for all eternity as the Trinity. We can now relate to God as God has always related within himself. This is the relationship he seeks. This is the unity that Jesus desires in the unity prayer. Coming back to John 17, just a couple of verses earlier, John 17 and verse 23. John 17, 23, here is the unity Jesus wants. I in them and you in me, speaking of the Father, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity. So the world may know that you sent me and love them, even as you have loved me. Again, coming back to what changes our relationship with God. That even as you have loved me, Father, as you have loved me, Jesus, so you are loving them. The relationship is the relationship of the love of the Trinity. Let's look at a couple of more important scriptures here. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 15 through 17. And we'll see the intensity of the unity that Jesus wants. And again, these scriptures, we look at these scriptures and think, oh, this is a little embarrassing. It's not embarrassing. It's beautiful. These are the words that were the Holy Spirit inspired St. Paul to write. How often he makes an analogy of the nuptial bond of marriage and the relationship between Jesus and the church. It is that intimate. It is more than that intimate. It is that close. This is the union that Jesus desires. Now, Corinth is a mess sexually. Um, you know, the, some of them think they should be having sex all the time. That's what the body is made for. And others are thinking, no, we must never have sex, must never get married. It's, it's a mess. And Paul is trying to clarify human sexuality for them. And he says, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Literally joined to the body of Christ, members of Christ. Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? Again, most of us are married. Most of us know. We know what he's talking about. It's very clear here. Do you know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says the two shall become one flesh. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. This is the intimate union, the deep closeness that Jesus desires. He gave us this as a shadow of the reality. Again, in Ephesians 5, this great chapter of, of, of marriage, Paul uses the same analogy because we're members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Again, we know what that means. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. This is the depth, the closeness, the unity. Again, we, we know what this means. Now think of Eucharist. Think of Eucharist. How much more intimate than even this, this nuptial act of the marriage bond that is. That rather than partially and temporarily, Jesus comes to every cell of our body to be united completely and closely. As again, I always make the analogy, you go to the airport and you see someone you haven't seen in a long time. You love them so much, you give them a deep hug. You just wish you can take them right into yourself. This is what Jesus literally does in the Eucharist. It is, is, it is the greatest hug of all time to bring us so closely to himself. This is the unity, the closeness, the intimacy that Jesus desires. Is that how we're approaching God now? Is that our relationship with him? Remember our blessed mother gave two definitions of the flame of love. One is it's Jesus himself, and that's absolutely critical. And the other is that it is this, this love that is the glue that binds us together, this binding love. Do we have that union, that binding love for Jesus? That's what we receive when we receive the flame of love. We do receive something tangible. This explosion of graces that does what? Brings us into this intimate union, this loving relationship with God. 
And if that's not the foundation of our relationship with God, we've got some growing to do. God's selfless love that comes from him as the effect of grace is the only sound foundation for our relationship with him. Let me repeat that. That's important. God's selfless love that comes from him as the effect of grace is the only sound foundation for our relationship with him. Now, we may not start there, and God accepts that. He knows that. We, we don't start perfect. We start in imperfection. And for some of us, very, very great imperfection. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know? So we may not start there, but we can't stay there. That's why the world so often does not see a very mature Christianity. We get stuck. We get stuck in distorted relationships with God, and we don't go beyond this imperfection. And when we do that, we even have a distorted view of the Bible. You know, if the Bible expresses the very being, the very word of God, if our relationship with God is skewed and distorted, we're going to distort what he says to us in the Bible. And there are a lot of distorted foundations on which we can build our relationship with God. And that's what we're going to be covering in depth today. And perhaps some of you will recognize this in your life. I certainly recognize them in my life. What are some of those distorted foundations of our rela or distorted relationships with God? One is obligation. Another one is knowledge, responsibility, fear, our human good, nationalism and patriotism that can mask spirituality. These things are not necessarily wrong, but they're not the foundation of our relationship with God. Obligation, knowledge, responsibility, fear, our human good, our nationalism, our patriotism. These are distorted relationships with God. Not only individually, but they can distort our relationships as church. And we can become the church of people who do the right things. Or the church of people who know the right things and have the right doctrines. The church of nice people. Sometimes we hear that. I hear that often of the Unitarians. They're such nice people. Don't believe Jesus is divine, but they're nice people. Rather than the church of the children of God who love and worship him with all their heart and soul and mind and strength is the effect of grace. That's the church we need to be, not the church who just has the right doctrines, knows the right things, does the right things, or is nice people. The church are the children of God who love and worship him with all their heart and soul and mind and strength as God has loved himself within himself for all eternity. That's the people we're called to be. So let's talk about this first one, obligation, obligation. Here's an important one, and I'll leave you with this important point. God prefers love to obligation. God prefers love to obligation. Let's take a look at, we'll learn this from a little tiny book of, of the New Testament, one of, the, one of the shortest, the letter of Paul to Philemon. A beautiful and a mature letter. Um, so many of the letters of Paul are written to churches in trouble. Right, Corinth is struggling with so many issues, all kinds of things. You know, Galatians, you, you stupid Galatians. You know, and Colossae is trying to keep them out of trouble. And so there are, most of them are dealing with very immature issues. There are a few, Philippians, Philemon, where Paul is writing to very strong Christians, and he can deal with mature issues and address them in a very mature way. And this is the case with the letter of Philemon. It is written by Paul from prison. He's probably in Rome, about 61, 63 AD. Uh, could be from Ephesus a little earlier, 56, 57. But he's writing from prison to Philemon. Philemon is a leader in the church at Colossae. So remember the letter to the Colossians. Philemon is a leader in that church. And the subject is another man named Onesimus, who happens to be one of Philemon's slaves. Now, that may sound a little strange that Christians have slaves, um, but it was indeed common practice. And slavery was very different. Unfortunately, in, in the Americas, we've had such a, a horrible history of awful, terrible, brutal, oppressive, dehumanizing slavery. Um, not all slavery was necessarily like that. For example, in the Old Testament, there was slavery, but it was really more like economic rehabilitation. Uh, just to, so in case people are confused about that when we read that. In the Old Testament, if someone became very impoverished, perhaps they weren't very good with money, perhaps they were irresponsible, who knows what happened in their lives, they could sell themselves as a slave to someone who was wealthier. But it wasn't permanent. It was only for seven years, and they were supposed to go out. And during that time, they could learn 
you know, how this person was prosperous. They, they, it was basically was a, a financial finance remediation class of how to be successful with funds. And then when the seven years were over, they weren't sent out empty handed. They were sent out with abundance. They were supposed to have a lot of provision from the one to whom they had sold themselves into slavery. So it was a, really a financial reset. They were sent out with goods and with flocks and with herds. They were sent out with, with an abundance to reset their life after those seven years. And in fact, if the slave owner abused their slave, the slave went out free. Now, this wasn't quite Roman slavery. Roman slavery wasn't that benevolent, but it also wasn't typically the brutal slavery that we had in the Americas. So in Rome, slaves were generally, not always, but generally well treated. But the big thing about Roman slavery was that the Roman economy ran on slavery. Slavery was essential to the economy. And so the Romans guarded slavery viciously. In fact, even though slaves were generally well treated, the penalty for a runaway slave was crucifixion. That's how seriously the Romans took slavery. Now, here's the problem. Onesimus is one of Philemon's slaves and he has run away. Not only has he run away, but somehow he ran away from Colossia all the way to Rome, found Paul and was baptized and became a Christian. So now what does Paul do? He has this runaway slave for whom the penalty is crucifixion. The slave is a Christian, a brother to another Christian, a leader in the church at Colossae. Now we might think, oh, of course it's simple. All you do is you forgive your, your brother and you just go on and, and this would not be a problem. Well, it's not really that simple. Let's put it in modern day terms. Let's say, for example, I'm, I'm a Christian who owns a trucking company and I hire one of my brothers, one of my fellow Christians as a truck driver, and I find that they've been driving drunk. Now, do I say, oh, he's my brother, so therefore I'm going to let it slide and I'm going to forgive him and, and not worry about it? Or do I say, no, no one drives my trucks drunk. No one takes someone else's life in their hands. I've got to make an example of him, even because he's my brother, that no one drives my trucks drunk. So this is the, the dilemma that both Paul and, um, and Philemon face in the letter to Philemon. So Paul writes this letter, and it's a beautiful letter. So I say it's one of the mature epistles. There is a very strong relationship between Paul and Philemon. And it reflects mature Christianity for time's sake, because we have so much to cover. I'm not going to read the introduction, but verses one to seven of this beautiful profession of how much Paul cares for Philemon and how close they are. But now let's go to where we begin the, the crux of what's happening in the letter to Philemon. We'll go down to uh, verse eight. So Philemon, oh, only, only one chapter in verse eight. And let me share my screen once more. So Paul is talking about this wonderful relationship he has with Philemon. And in verse eight, he says, therefore, though I have enough confidence in Christ to order you to do what is proper. Okay, so here's an important point. Paul has the authority to tell Philemon, this is what you have to do. And so it is with our relationship with God. Right? God has every right to tell us what to do. I have a few scriptures here in your notes. Again, I'm going to have to pass over uh, for time's sake. But Romans 9, right? That, you know, we're the clay, God's the potter. Who are we to argue with the potter? And this master-slave relationship of having to obey was the old covenant relationship. Again, I won't take time to read the ratification of the old covenant, but it is basically all that the Lord has said we will obey. It was this this relationship of obedience, this master-slave relationship. But the new covenant is different. Let's go to that. Let's go to Jeremiah 31, verse 31. <clears throat> Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. This is a different covenant. Why is it different? Because there's a different spirit at work. In the old covenant, they only had the spirit in man. They could only relate to God as humans. In the new covenant, we're given the spirit of God. We can relate to God as God. The entire relationship is fundamentally changed. 
It is not one of just slavish obedience, although obedience is important. We'll come to that. But it must go beyond that. It is the relationship that we're going to see that Philemon has here with Paul. So Paul says, therefore, though I have enough confidence in Christ to order you to do what is proper, yet for love's sake, I rather appeal to you. Since I am such a person as Paul, the age and now a prisoner of Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my imprisonment. All right, so here we see the subject of the letter. He's appealing to him for love. This is not a master-slave relationship. It's a family relationship. In 2 Corinthians 6.18, I won't turn there, but I will be a father to them. You will be sons and daughters. Now think about it. Do we serve our children out of obligation or out of love? Uh, some days, <laughs> some days, yeah, maybe it's out of obligation. But most of the time, hopefully, we serve our children out of love. And what delights us more? Our children obeying us because they have to. All right, Dad, if I have to, because they don't want to have their privilege taken away or be grounded or they want to get whatever they want out of us. You know, is, is that what delights us or when they obey because they want to? Sure, Dad, I'll do that. Of course, I'll do that. What gives us more delight when our children obey because they love us or because they want to get something out of us because they don't want to be punished by us? This is the idea here. This is what's going on in this letter. Why Paul's saying, I could do it this way, but I don't want to do it that way. So again, let's take a look at this as a family relationship. Obedience is important. So I don't want to be misunderstood. I don't want us to say, anyone to even think that love means we don't have to obey. Oh, I love God, so therefore I can go out and I can fornicate and I can lie and I can do all the things that I want to do. No, 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 no. You know, Obedience is important, but it's a given. It's assumed we're going to be obedient. Think about it again. Come back to the family. Do our children make us happy because they do not commit grievous sin? You know, if our children come home from school and say, oh, mom and dad, you'd be so happy with me today. I didn't kill anyone. You know, we, might, we might be more worried rather than happy. You know? <clears throat> That's not what gives us joy. Well, when our kids come home from school and they say, oh, mom, I hope I hope you don't mind. But, you know, Jim, Jimmy's daddy was uh, was laid off and all he had was an apple for lunch. And so I gave him half a mind. Do you mind? You know, that kind of melts our heart, make, makes us go, you know, crinkle all up. You know, so it's not that obedience isn't important, but obedience is a given. It's not necessarily our children's just strict obedience because they want to get something out of us that makes us happy. It's when they're truly loving people. Love does not eliminate obedience. So don't even think of intentionally disobeying. I mean, there, there are no exceptions to the idea that there are no sinners in heaven. I think we read that last, right? The two categories of people who won't be in heaven, the unrighteous and the unmerciful. No sinners in heaven. No exceptions. No one's going to say, oh, he, he, he was such a kind person and passed such great legislation, but... Yeah, yes, he, he he mandated abortion and legislated abortion, but we'll, we'll let him in because he was such a nice person. No, if they don't repent of this, you know, there's, there's no saying, oh, they loved each other so much. So even though it was a, a, a gay marriage and they were having sex with each other without any openness to life, not possible to be open to life, but they were so nice, we'll, we'll let them in anyway. No. She was such a nice person. She served so diligently on the church committees, but she had, you know, yeah, she gossiped a lot and she undercut people and she stabbed in the back, but, but she was so, did so much. We'll let her in anyway. No, there are no exceptions for sinners in heaven. Right? Love does not eliminate obedience. However, a relationship stunted at the level of obedience alone is not pleasing to God. A relationship stunted at the level of obedience alone is not what God desires. We must move beyond obedience to faith and love. That doesn't make obedience go away. It just builds on top and goes beyond to faith and to love. Like Paul's introductions, like his introduction that we didn't read to Philemon. You know, this faith springs from a trust in God's love. And it's this trust 
this love that puts a smile on God's face, not just our obedience, that's expected. The foundation of our relationship with God is always this love. God's relationship with us is never self-centered. God never does anything for us because he wants to get something out of us. He has every right to everything. He can throw us away, make it 10,000 more universes. God's relationship with us is never self-centered. Neither is the relationship he seeks from us. He seeks the relationship fueled by the same selfless love with which he loves us. That the love with which you loved me, Father, will be in them. This is the relationship he wants. And it is strictly on the basis of love that Paul now makes his request to Philemon. Let's go back to that, le that letter. And we'll see how this relationship, this mature relationship of Christianity manifests itself in the letter. So Paul writes to Philemon. He says, I have sent him back to you in person. Now there is trust. There, imagine this. You know, you have Philemon, who knows the penalty for running away is crucifixion. And Paul sends him back to Philemon, knowing that Philemon could legally crucify Onesimus. And Onesimus goes back, letter in hand. This is trust. This is the relationship that Paul has with Philemon and the relationship that God wants with us. I have sent him back to you in person. That is sending my very heart whom I wish to keep with me so that on your behalf he might minister to me in my imprisonment for the gospel. But without your consent, I did not want to do anything so that your goodness would not be in effect by compulsion, but of your own free will. Can you see the very mature Christian relationship that Paul has with Philemon? But without your consent, I didn't want to do anything so that your goodness would not be by compulsion, but of your own free will. This is the relationship that God wants with us. Yes, he could order us what to do and we would have to obey. But that's not the relationship he wants. That's not the relationship that Paul has with Philemon. In fact, notice how this concludes. We'll skip over this all the way down to 21. Verse 21. And see what confidence Paul has in the strength of his relationship with Philemon. This is the confidence God wants in his relationship with us. He writes, having confidence in your obedience, right? Obedience doesn't go away. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you, since I know that you will do even more than what I say. That's what love does. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you since I know that you'll do even more than what I say. And isn't that how God is to us, right? We often have that reading in Ephesians 3, that beautiful reading. And what does it say about God? Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. This is how God loves us, how God gives to us. And this is the relationship that he wants with us. Not one of just obedience, but one of going above and beyond. Paul encourages it the same way. Again, I won't turn there for time, but 2 Corinthians 9, 7, what does he say? God loves a cheerful giver, not one who just gives because he has to. This is the way that love works. This is the nature of our relationship with God. Jesus in the diary, April 10th, 1962, he's speaking of the passion. And Jesus says, I went to the limit. And I tell you, you cannot go to excess in doing something for me. That's the way love works. It's not an accounting mentality. It's not, okay, I have to do this and I have to do that. How many goods do I have versus how many bads do I have? If we try to have an accounting relationship with God, all we can do is come up short. Now, an accounting relationship with God always will come up short. Let's look at Luke 17, verses 7 to 10. Luke 17, verses 7 to 10. An important parable in this regard. Where Jesus has this parable of which of you having a slave plowing, attending sheep will say to him when he comes into the field, oh, come immediately and sit down to eat. But doesn't he say to him, no, go prepare something for me to eat and properly clothe yourself and serve me while I eat and drink. And afterwards you can eat and drink. He does not thank the slave because he did the things that were commanded, does he? So you too, 
when you do all the things which are commanded, you say, we are unworthy slaves. We have done only which we ought to have done. Oh, yes, I obeyed. I went to church every Sunday. I made my meals tasteless. I fasted. I kept night vigil. I did this. I did that. I did the other thing. Great. All you did was, was what was expected of you. We are unworthy slaves. We have done only what we ought to have done. Just as Jesus said here, I went to the limit for you. You cannot do too much for me. So it's not an accounting mentality. It's a love relationship. It's not what must I do, but what can I do? This is how God is toward us and how we must be toward him. Not just obedience, love. Love prefers, God prefers love to just our obligation to do what we have to do. But that's not the only distorted relationship we can have with God. Let's take a look at Elijah. Elijah is just one of the most important characters of the entire Old Testament. He is a powerful servant of God. One of the two great characters of the Old Testament. In, in the Transfiguration, who's on the mount with Jesus? Moses and Elijah, the two great figures of the Old Testament. The end of the book of Malachi, the very end of the Old Testament. What, what is said, I will send the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So Elijah is a critically, critically important person in the history of the church and the history of the people of God. So oh, let me just take care of, of uh, muting one, one bit of sound here and we'll get back to, to this. So <clears throat> Elijah, we can describe as the responsible man who knew the right things. His relationship with God, with God was based upon responsibility and knowledge. Now, Elijah is an amazing man, an amazing man. He's a hard man for hard times. He's a very hard times in Israel. You have Ahab is king. He's the worst king ever. Jezebel is not an Israelite. She's queen. She's just complete pagan. She's literally systematically trying to wipe out the worship of God and killing the prophets and, and the priests. He is a hard man for hard times. In fact, towards the end of his life, I won't go there for time's sake, 2 Kings 1, you know, the, the, the king is sending out these armies to go after him. He sends 50 armed men to go get Elijah. And Elijah calls down fire from heaven and burns them up. And another 50 comes and he calls down fire from heaven and burns them up. And, and the third group kind of get it and they say, oh, please, <laughs> please, <laughs> please don't burn us up. Just please come with us. You know, and he does. But he is one tough cookie. A hard man for hard times. He is deeply responsible. He is doing the work of God despite the fact that prophets are being killed left, right, and center. He is task-oriented. He is a go-getter. Nothing is going to stop him. He is zealous. Right? Even today, the, he is the patron of the Carmelites. With, with zeal, I have been zealous for the Lord. Nothing stands in the way of his service to God. He is fearless. He is strong. He is powerful. He is responsible. And he is the custodian of knowledge. That the knowledge of God has perished from the land. Jezebel is trying to wipe it out. And he's the custodian of knowledge. And he has this great confrontation with the prophets of Baal. Right? He calls Israel up to Mount Carmel. And they have the two sacrifices. And he says, "Don't no, put no fire under them. The God who answers by fire, he's the true God. And he says to the people, how long are you going to limp between two opinions? It wasn't that they were only following Baal. They were, had this kind of, they were kind of living both in the world and, and, and the covenant at the same time. Just like we sometimes do. How often are you going to live both in the world and live for God? Like James says, adulterers, adulteresses. Don't you know that love for the world is, is infidelity to God? And this is what the Israelites were doing. And he says, Jews, and they don't say anything. And finally, of course, nothing happens but the sacrifice to Baal. But fire drops down from heaven and consumes the sacrifice to God that Elijah offers. And all the people fall down and say, Eliah, Eliah, that's Elijah's name. Yah is God. Yah is God's name. El is the word for God. Eliha, Eliha, Eliha. Yah is God. And he turns the people back to the Lord. Tremendous man. But all is not well. There's something awry in Elijah's relationship with God. And God is going to go so far to show Elijah and to get Elijah's relationship with him right. Because I don't think there's anything more important to God. Now, again, sometimes we, we make the dogmatic statements and we, did, we dogmatize our own personal opinions. So I don't know if that's exactly true, but I would venture a guess 
that the most important thing to God for us is his relationship with us and our relationship with him. That it is founded on this love that comes as the effect of grace. That's what we were made for. And he will do anything to get that relationship right. Whether it's what happened to Job that we'll talk about after our break. Whether it's happened to Elijah. Whether it happens in the trials and difficulties of our own life. The most important priority is not our comfort and our happiness and our well-being. But our relationship with him. That it not be distorted. That we truly be in love with God for forever. And this is what Elijah had to learn. Let's go to 1 Kings 19, and we'll see how Elijah's relationship with God, even after this great com- the great confrontation with the prophets of Baal and this great victory, and he hacks, hacks to pieces the prophets of Baal. Again, he's one tough cookie. <laughs> he just hacks the, the prophets to, to death. And yet look what happens after Jezebel says, all right, Elijah, now you're in my sights. Now I'm after you. <clears throat> and Elijah flees. And he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die. He is completely discouraged. He says, it's enough now, O Lord. Take my life, for I am not better than my father's. All that responsibility, all that zeal, all that knowledge has come to nothing. And of course, he lays down the angel, taps him on the shoulder and says, get up and eat. And he does it again. He says, you got a long journey in front of you. And he goes to Horeb and he comes to this cave and lodges there. And the word of the Lord came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah responds in a very Elijah way. <clears throat> I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel that have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left and they seek my life to take it away. His relationship with God is an absolute crisis, and God is now going to do something about it. So God tells him, go forth and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And then God does all kinds of Elijah-type things. All right, so so he goes to the, he tries to go, he can't, and this is important. He can't do what God has asked him to do. He tries to go, but there's this great and strong wind that's rending the mountains and breaking in pieces of the rock before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. And the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. Again, all Elijah-type things. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a gentle blowing. And it's only then in the gentleness that Elijah can do what God has asked. So then when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And again, Elijah says, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left. They seek to take my life. And then the Lord gives him a plan. This soft, gentle voice gives him a plan. It's not a plan that's going to unfold overnight. He doesn't magically change Elijah's relationship. It's a plan that's going to take 13 years to unfold, if I recall correctly. And part of that plan is Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel Mehla, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. So God has a plan to restructure his relationship with Elijah, which is strong. I wish we all had a relationship that Elijah had with God, but there's still something more that Elijah needs to learn. And so he sends him to Elisha to be prophet in his stead. Now, Elisha is a complete, complete contrast to Elijah. And I I wish we read more about Elisha in the liturgy. We don't read much about him. Beautiful, beautiful man. Elisha is very wealthy. When when Elijah encounters him, he's plowing behind 12 yoke of oxen. He is a wealthy, wealthy man. And then Elijah does a very Elijah thing. He throws his mantle at him. And Elisha says, let me just say goodbye to my mother and father. And Elijah says, what have I done to you? But Elisha isn't just going to say goodbye to his mother and father. He goes and he slaughters the 12 oxen and he takes the yoke and and he he makes the fire and he makes a sacrifice and he basically feeds the whole village. He's a very kind, loving man who cares about people. And so he he just makes this great feast for the whole village, his whole family, before he leaves to follow Elijah. 
And we see this kindness and this gentleness, this loving nature of Elisha throughout. Again, I wish I had time to go there because we don't often read these accounts, but they're beautiful. In 2 Kings 4, you have this account where I, I believe the, the prophets are building in, in, the, in the woods and they're cutting down trees and the ax head falls into the river. And again, these aren't the days we could just go to the local hardware store and buy another ax head. This was a big deal. And when Elisha comes and he puts his hand over the water and, and, and the ax head actually floats up in the water to recover the ax. Where he encounters a woman who is so poor that her son is going to be sold into slavery. And he tells her to take all these jars and fill them with oil. And there's so much oil that she's able to pay off her debts and ransom her son. Kind, kind man. And the one I love most of all is this one in 2 Kings 6. Where the king of Aram has been fighting with the king of Israel. And the king of Israel keeps winning because Elisha keeps telling the king of Israel what the king of Aram is doing. And so the king of Aram sends his army to Elisha's house to capture him. And, you know, the, the, the servants who are with him are all frightened. And he says, don't worry about it. He says, God opened their eyes. And they see all the chariots of fire in the trees, all the angels about to defend him. And he goes out to the whole army of Aram. And he says, God, please blind them. And God blinds them. So the whole army is blind. And he goes to him and says, oh, follow me. I'll take you where you want to go. And he leads the whole army of Aram to the city of, of Samaria, the capital of, of Israel. And so the whole army is now surrounded in the capital city of Israel, surrounded by the Israelite army. And he says, okay, God, open their eyes. And the king of Israel says, oh, great. Shall we kill them all? And Elisha says, no, feed them, send them home. And he does. And the war ends. How I wish this is how we ended our wars. But you see Elisha's great kindness, his great love. So no wonder why God has teamed Elijah with Elisha. So that Elijah can learn this God of mercy and this God of love. But the crowning event is what happens with King Ahab. And from there, let's go there. Let's go to 1 Kings 21. In 1 Kings 21, we have the horrible story of Naboth's vineyard. And if you remember the, the story, Naboth has this, this vineyard that's right next to this, this palace of Ahab in one of, his, one of the cities. And Ahab wants it for, uh, uh, for himself. Ahab wants it for himself. And so he says to Naboth, can you please sell this to me? And Naboth says, I can't do that. It's my family inheritance. I can't sell it. And Ahab, it's like a child. He goes into his room and he's sulking on the wall. His face is turned to the wall and he's, he's sulking. And Jezebel comes in. Now, Ahab knows as an Israelite that the king is subject to the law. Je Jezebel is not an Israelite. She's, I think, the king of the daughter of the king of Tyre. And she has no concept of the king being subject to anyone. She says, don't worry about it. I'll get the vineyard for you. And so she sets up this terrible ruse where they invite Naboth into this feast. And then he's accused of blasphemy. And he's stoned to death. He's murdered. And then she says to Ahab, go down and take possession of the vineyard. And of course, this is deeply, deeply upsetting to God. God just is going to do something about this. And so God sends Elijah to reprimand Ahab and pronounce upon him a terrible curse. You know, and so let me, let me I'll go share screen again here and you'll, you'll see this. And so he sends e e Elijah to, um, to Ahab. And Ahab says to Elijah when he meets him, have you found me, O my enemy? And yes, I found you because you sold yourself to do evil in the sight of the Lord. And he's going to bring this great evil upon him. He's going to cut off every single male from Ahab. And the dogs are going to lick up your blood just like they licked up, uh, na licked up Naboth's blood. And Jezebel is going to be eaten by the dogs. And one belonged to Ahab who dies in the city, the dogs will eat. And one who dies in the field, the birds of heaven will eat. Because Ahab has been so evil, he's just gone over the top now. And then notice what happens here in verse 27. It came about when Ahab heard these words that he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went about despondently. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite saying, do you see how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days, but I will bring the evil upon his house in his son's days. So God is pointing out something very important here to Elijah. That it's not just about punishment and retribution and what is owed. That God is a God of mercy who hears the voice of the penitent. 
So Elijah, in this final confrontation here, learns a lesson in mercy. He learns the God of love, very similar to what we're going to see in the life of Jonah. Elijah learns from Elisha and from this experience with Ahab, who then repents, and God then relents of the punishment he's going to bring upon him. And in this, Elijah begins to learn the truth of his relationship with God. You know, that Elijah was a great custodian of knowledge, but his knowledge was not enough. But again, for time's sake, I won't go there. But 1 Corinthians 13, right? Though I have not, though I have the tongues of men and of angels, right? Do I have all knowledge? Do I give my body to be burned, but I have not love? I'm nothing. Knowledge is not enough. Now, sometimes we have this in the church. Sometimes I must have to laugh. It's like we're ingrained with it. We, we, we go to school, we go to faith formation, we go to Catholic school, and we always want to have the right answer for the teacher, right? Yes, yes, teach, teacher, teacher, yes, I know the answer. And sometimes in the Mass, it's like we have the same thing. You know, we have, we, behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Oh, yes, 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 I know the answer. Oh, Lord, I'm not worthy. You shouldn't run my room, but I say the word, and I should be healed. You know? and, we, and we spew out the words and we get it all right, but it's like we have no heart. It's like all we have is we know the right things to say. We know when to kneel, we know when to stand. But do we love our God? Now, knowledge of God is a wonderful thing. That's why we have these retreats. That's why we're in the scriptures. Knowledge of God is a wonderful thing. But knowing about God is not knowing him. Something I learned very much after decades, after 20 years of just studying and studying and learning all, all about God, everything I could read and study, all knowing about God, I had to realize that I was one giant walking head relationship with God. That God says he wants us to love him, not with just all our mind, but all our heart and soul and mind and strength. Knowing about God is not knowing him. To truly know God, we must be in love with him. How is God defined? First John 4, 8, God is love. Like Bishop Barron explained, it's so beautiful. We say God is Trinity and we say God is love. It's the same thing. You know, to love, you have to have the lover, the beloved, and you have the fruit of their love, the Trinity. God is love, not God loves. God is love. Since God is love, love is the only basis of a relationship with him, not knowledge. Same thing with responsibility. Responsibility alone is not enough. If our relationship with our children ended with our chores, how empty would that relationship be? What kind of relationship would that be? So why do we treat God that way? Why do we treat God that way? Yes, we serve, but service should be an outgrowth of love. Anything else is rooted in self. Are we serving God because we want to get something out of him? Because we want to be happy? Because we want to, we want heaven? We don't want to go to hell? Are we serving God just to get something out of him? Are we serving God for ourselves? Or are we serving God out of selfless love for God? If right service is founded on love, then service can't be the foundation. Love is the foundation from which comes our service. And let me share this important quote from the diary that puts this in perspective and says it so clearly. This is November 8th, 1964. For many days, the Lord Jesus instructed me on piety. And he asked, or rather lamented, Jesus said, listen to me and do not be surprised that I have complained for some days even about pious souls. Souls that are praying, souls that have the right answer in mass, souls that are doing the right things and praying their novenas and, and doing their, their fasting or whatever it is. Listen to me. Do not be surprised. I've complained for some days even about pious souls. I want you to atone for them also because pious souls who make no sacrifices hurt my heart even more. Oh, how sad I am to see the multitude of devout souls, devout souls living a pious life without earning much merit on behalf of their eternal salvation. So many of them do not attempt to come close to me in any way, as though they're afraid. The sorrow for their sins does not stem from love. My request to those who are indifferent, there is no progress without sacrifice. I am not happy with a sterile piety. It is like a tree that produces no fruit. I'll add this, my Elizabeth. The pious people who are like this do not even think at what point their soul is gray and dark. 
the light of grace only penetrates and illumines the soul burning with love to the degree that they expose their soul to the transforming effect of my grace. Remember I said how the most important effect of grace is the transformation of our relationship with God. And look at what he says next. For it is also a habit of pious souls to think that after having spent a good time at their devotions, they have already given to God what is God's. Oh, you fools. Live streaming is on. That is one powerful statement. For it is also a habit of pious souls to think that after having spent a good time at their devotions, they have already given to God what is God's. Oh, you fools. If you could only feel the immense pain your pious indifference causes to my divine heart. Powerful, powerful statement by God. If our relationship just stops with our responsibility, that's hurting God. That's hurting God. He'll do anything like he did with Elijah to get us to fall in love with him because he's in love with us. And this is what our eternity is. One more before we take a break. So we've looked at obligation. We've looked at responsibility. We've looked at knowledge. Let's look at our own human goodness. I want to look at the example of Cornelius. Cornelius, again, one of the most important characters of the New Covenant, New Testament. Now for Cornelius, almost none of us would be here. And with Cornelius, we see, again, a foundation that needs to be changed. Something needs to be changed in Cornelius's relationship with God. Our goodness, our goodness cannot be the foundation for our relationship with God. Now, most of us don't think that it is, but in reality, we often live that way. It's a very, very subtle problem. We never say it, but we live like it. In fact, I, I sometimes joke about good person syndrome. And in fact, it's more than a joke. When I'm teaching RCIA, I often warn people who are coming into the church and tell them, you know, someday somewhere in your life in the church, someone is going to do something or say something really stupid to you. Don't be offended. Focus on God, not the people who do stupid things in the church, because we tend to fall into good person syndrome. And we tend to think, well, you know, I, I pray and I go to church and I'm a good person. So therefore, we kind of make the assumption that everything we do is good. Not realizing that sometimes good people do really stupid things. So our goodness is not a right foundation for God. And in fact, until we recognize the shortcomings of our goodness and repent of our goodness, repent of it, we are blind to God's goodness. If we think that goodness and love looks like just as Jesus described in Matthew 5, you know, we love those who love us. We're happy with our families. We're happy with our neighbors. We love the people who love us. We have this wonderful world filled with love and with goodness for those we love and those who love us. Until we see how inadequate that is, we cannot see the incredible wonder of God's love as shown to us on the cross. As long as we think we're good enough, we are miserable and we are blind. We have to come to see the inadequacy of our goodness and our love. That's what we spoke about in the first retreat. The more we see how utterly miserable we are, the more clearly we see God. We see the contrast. And we see that even our good and even our love is just absolutely inadequate for heaven, contrasted to God's love, that for all eternity, for not one nanosecond has ever stopped. If it did, the whole universe would disappear. This is a beautiful thing. It kind of reminds me of the Lorica of St. Patrick, you know, how he arises every day to the, the, the mighty strength, the invocation of the Holy Trinity, how every single moment the universe is sustained by God's love. It never, ever stops. Our every moment is a testament to God's love. Until we see the inadequacy of our goodness, we do not see the beauty of God, nor do we see the holiness to which God calls us and will transform us by the effect of grace. So therefore, our goodness cannot be the basis of our relationship with God. And this is the lesson of Cornelius. Now, Cornelius is a very good man. God says he's a good man. He's an important man. And he's, he's, the, uh, he's, he's a centurion in the Italian cohort. And that means something very special, again, filling in a little bit of history. So a Roman legion had 6,000 soldiers, and it was organized into 60 centuries of 100 men, each led by a centurion. And a cohort was 10 centuries, 600 men. You see this, the whole cohort comes to Jesus when they're beating him up, uh, when they're crowning him with thorns. Now, the Italian cohort was a special cohort. 
that the Roman army was largely made up of people from conquered countries and they gained their Roman citizenship by serving in the army, except for the Italian cohort. The Italian cohort was made of, 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 of what would become Italians, of Italic people, of Romans. And they were particularly important and looked after and defended Roman interests. And so Cornelius is an important man. He's a centurion in the, uh, the um, Italian cohort. So let's pick up the story in Acts 10. In Acts 10, an angel comes and appears to Cornelius. He's going to be the first Gentile brought into the church without first becoming a Jew. And how look how it describes him, a devout man, one who feared God with all his household, gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continuously. And the angel comes to him and says, um, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Even God recognizes how good Cornelius is, but there's something he has to do. So he says, go and send men to Joppa for Simon. And Simon is going to come and tell you something very, very important, something that you need. And it's a great story. I wish I had time to go through it. We're going to skip over a lot of it. Let's see what we can skip over for time's sake. Um, all right. We notice that this good person is directed to the church his goodness is not adequate enough i think i can skip over some of this so <clears throat> you know peter comes and cornelius explains to him what the angel told him to do and he did it you know so we see cornelius's goodness and his openness to change he wants to hear what peter has to say and of course now we have the holy spirit comes upon them and they're all baptized the whole household is baptized one of the reasons why we believe in infant baptism. It wasn't just the adults, the whole household was baptized. And when Peter comes back, he's challenged about going in to visit the Gentiles. This is something Jews just did not do. Peter was really, really going outside his comfort zone to go into the house of a Gentile and speak to them. And let's go to Acts 11, where Peter is defending himself and we'll see an important new detail. And so Peter is, is recounting what Cornelius explained to him, how he reported the angel came and said, send to Joppa and have Simon, who was called Peter, brought here. And now notice this important detail that wasn't in Acts 10. And he will speak words to you by which you will be saved. So even though he was a good man, commended by God, he needed something more to be saved. And as it began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them. He needed the Holy Spirit. He needed the effect of grace that comes by the Holy Spirit to change his relationship with God <clears throat> from one based upon his human goodness to one based upon that the love that you have for me, Father, will be in them. The love that comes is the effect of grace. And you notice that when they hear this, they, they're, they're, they think this is great. And then when they heard this, they quieted down and glorified God in verse 18, saying, well, then God has granted to the Gentiles also the repentance. Notice a good man commended by God for his goodness has to repent. Repent of what? Even his human goodness. And only that repentance of our human goodness can lead to life based upon God's goodness, based upon God's love within us. So again, this important understanding that our own human goodness is inadequate as our relationship, foundation of our relationship with God. Only that love, only that love can bring us to eternal life. Only that love is the foundation of our relationship with God, because that is the love we will have in heaven for forever. Not the love that only loves the ones that love us, not the good that only lasts and we have reinforcement but the good and the love that is willing to mount the cross. This is what we have. The life of God through the spirit, enabling us to have a godly relationship with God, not our own goodness. So we've looked at several different distorted relationships with God. We're going to take a break because we've been at the